ओके दे ओके दे ओके सर आई विल गिव यू द प्रेजेंटर राइट्स आफ्टर 4:30 ना आफ्टर 4:30 ना राइट यस नो इशू आई विल जस्ट क्लोज दिस ऑन यस सर ओके दे चैनल शांति कुंज वीडियो गायत्री परिवार को सब्सक्राइब करें एवं बेल चैनल शांति कुंज वीडियो गायत्री परिवार को सब्सक्राइब
Good evening, everyone. This session will begin at 4.30. I request everyone to keep their microphones and their videos on mute during the talk. We'll be circulating a couple of uh, mobile numbers on which you can pose your questions to Dr. Chidambra. Uh, and we'll try and take as many questions as we can once the talk is concluded, uh, depending on the availability of time. I request everyone to be on mute, uh, their videos on mute, so that there is no issue of bandwidth and you are able to uh, discuss Dr. Chidambram's discourse smoothly and seamlessly.
I once again welcome all the participants on Dia Mumbai's platform Gyan Sabha. This is a thought platform for thought leaders where people from different walks of life, different professions come for confluence of thoughts which are ultimately crucial for building our nation and in taking the youth of this country forward and invigorating them to do something for the country. That is the entire purpose of Gyan Sabha. And the basis of Gyan Sabha, or, or rather the basis of DIA, Divine India Youth Association, which we'll shortly see by way of a documentary, is on the foundation of scientific spirituality when we consider science and spirituality as two sides of the same coin and not something which exists in isolation. So we'll focus on that concept as well. And with the with the help of a documentary, we'll see what activities DIA does and how youth from different professions, different walks of life have come together on this platform and are doing whatever they can, doing their bit in order to promote harmony, in order to create a conducive environment of learning and an environment which ultimately caters to the needs of the nation. Dr. Chidampram would be here um, any moment and we'll commence our talk shortly. So we'll, we'll shortly see a documentary about DIA, the evolution of DIA. To give a background, DIA was conceived by former president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam and Reverend Dr. Pranav Pandyaji, who is the chancellor of Dev Sanskriti University in uh, Haridwar. At the second convocation ceremony of DSVV, both these thinkers met and they thought that there is a dire need to give a platform to the youth of this country where they can channelize their energies, uh, where they contribute their ideas and innovations so that a confluence of ideas at, at a cohesive level emerge so that these ideas are utilized in activities which are constructive and activities which contribute to the growth of the nation. So that was the background under which DIA was conceived and, and uh, formed as, as uh, the youth wing of All World Gayatri Parivar, which was uh, formed by Yugrishi Pandit Sri Ram Sharma Acharyaji. And uh, I welcome Dr. Chidambaram who has just joined us. Uh, we extend a very cordial and warm welcome to you, sir. And uh, I think it is appropriate that we look at, at the documentary now and see what DIA does and uh, what is the, the objective behind forming this platform. आवाज नहीं येता है रिया
Not heard. Not heard. Audio is not there. Okay, now we can hear. व्यक्ति के निर्माण का स्वर्णिम समय यौवन काल होता है जिसमें वह आने वाले लंबे जीवन के लिए शरीर मन और आत्मा का निर्माण और विकास करता है इसी नींव पर अपने जीवन का मजबूत भवन खड़ा करता है और उसका भोग करता है किसी भी राष्ट्र के विकास की आधारशिला और ऊर्जा उसकी युवा शक्ति ही होती है यही उसका आत्मबल और इच्छा शक्ति भी होती है इसीलिए कहा गया है वीर भोग्य वसुंधरा राष्ट्र निर्माण के ताने बाने में यौवन के ही धागे होते हैं अतः जो राष्ट्र अपनी इस ऊर्जा का संरक्षण और संवर्धन करता है वह विकास के उच्च शिखर पर पहुंचता है राष्ट्र के कृषि उद्योग शिक्षा चिकित्सा तकनीक राजनीति रूपी चक्के को यही युवा शक्ति ऊर्जा व गति प्रदान करती है यह राष्ट्र की रगों में बहने वाला गर्म खून है जो उसे चैतन्य और प्रगतिशील बनाता है भौतिक व आध्यात्मिक दोनों के विकास में इसी ऊष्मा का तप सक्रिय रहता है इतिहास साक्षी रहा है कि जब जब किसी राष्ट्र की धुरी रड़खड़ाई है युवा शक्ति ने आगे आकर अपने पुरुषार्थ से उसे सुदृढ़ बनाया है आज अनेक प्रकार की समस्याएं जैसे नशा फैशन परस्ती पाश्चात्य जीवन शैली आस्था संकट भ्रष्टाचार बेरोजगारी देश की युवा शक्ति पर आरूढ़ है आज युवा शक्ति को आत्मबोध एवं अपने सांस्कृतिक गौरव से परिचित कराना समय की मांग है वर्ष 2011 की जनगणना के अनुसार हमारे देश में 35 वर्ष तक की उम्र की पैंसठ प्रतिशत आबादी है यह युवा शक्ति जिधर चल पड़ेगी देश भी उधर ही चल पड़ेगा अतः देश का भविष्य अब युवाओं के हाथ में है यह युवा शक्ति ही राष्ट्र शक्ति बनकर राष्ट्र को समृद्धि उन्नति एवं प्रगति के मार्ग पर ले जाएगी युगृषि पंडित श्री राम शर्मा आचार्य जी ने युवा की अद्भुत परिभाषा दी है युवा वो है असंभव जिसके शब्द कोश में नहीं जो बाधाओं को चीर कर अपना मार्ग बनाता है जो परिस्थितियों का दास नहीं उनका निर्माता नियंत्रण करता एवं स्वामी है जो भाग्य नहीं अपने कर्म पर विश्वास रखता है जो उमंग उत्साह जोश से जीता वो सुनहरे भविष्य के सपने देखता है जो स्वयं सब कुछ करके गौरव अनुभव करता है और विश्व में कुछ अनूठा करना चाहता है असमंजस व अवसाद की स्थिति से गुजर रही युवा पीढ़ी को दिशा देने का काम एक चिंता की कर सकता है वर्ष 2006 में देव संस्कृति विश्वविद्यालय के दीक्षांत समारोह में पूर्व राष्ट्रपति डॉक्टर ए पी जे अब्दुल कलाम व श्रद्धेय डॉक्टर प्रणव पंडिया जी जो विश्वविद्यालय के कुलपति भी हैं मिले और इन दोनों चिंतकों ने मंथन किया कि युवा पीढ़ी को एक सृजनात्मक मंच देने की आवश्यकता है जो राष्ट्र निर्माण में सहायक हो यही से दिया कि नींव रखी गई आई एम इंडी डिलाइटेड टू पार्टिसिपेट इन द सेकेंड कॉन्वेकेशन ऑफ देव संस्कृति विश्वविद्यालय आई एम वेरी हैप्पी दैट दिस इंस्टीट्यूशन हैज बीन क्रिएटेड विथ अ मॉटो ऑफ डेवलपिंग द डिवाइन कल्चर विच इज ऑफ अटमोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट फेस while we are on the path of transforming india into a prosperous happy and peaceful society we have the responsibility of transforming india into a developed nation before the year 2020 it is an endless journey through knowledge and enlightenment such a journey opens up new vistas of development or humanism where there is no scope nor room for pettiness disharmony jealousy and hatred our enmity it transform a human being into a wholesome whole your noble soul and an asset to the universe god bless you
जिस तरह एक दिया अंधकार को दूर करने की क्षमता रखता है दिया भी इस देश के युवा मन से अंधेरे को दूर करने का स्वप्न लेकर चला है कि प्रशिक्षण और कार्यशालाओं के माध्यम से शिक्षित स्वस्थ आत्मनिर्भर विनम्र संवेदनशील दिव्य युवाओं को तैयार करने के लिए प्रयासरत है जिससे राष्ट्र निर्माण की रचनात्मक गतिविधियाँ चलाई जा सके दिव्य भारत का पुनर्निर्माण इसका लक्ष्य युवाओं की क्षमताओं का विकास कर दिव्य भारत का निर्माण करना है जिसमें व्यक्ति परिवार व समाज का उत्थान दिया युवाओं के सपनों में आदर्शवाद लाकर उनकी वैचारिक प्रक्रिया में सकारात्मक बदलाव लाने के लिए प्रयासरत है वैज्ञानिक अध्यात्म के माध्यम से युवाओं में देवत्व की अभिव्यक्ति दुनिया में सद्भाव के साथ सत्युग की वापसी इसका परम उद्देश्य है इस तथ्य की महत्वता समझते हुए वो डॉक्टर कलाम के भारत को वर्ष 2020 तक एक समृद्ध राष्ट्र बनाने के स्वप्न की ओर युवा शक्ति को अग्रसर करने के लिए दिया इस महान राष्ट्र के युवाओं के लिए एक आंदोलन है जो मजबूत सिद्धांतों और यथार्थवादी लक्ष्यों पर आधारित है जो लोग दिल और दिमाग से युवा हैं एवं जो एक नए भारत की परिकल्पना के हमारे स्वप्न से सहमत है उम्र जाति या धर्म की परवाह किए बगैर हमसे जुड़े मुझे विश्वास है गायत्री परिवार के दिया आंदोलन के माध्यम से देश के युवाओं में वो संवेदनाएं प्रकट होगी सामाजिक जिम्मेवारियां प्रकट होगी एक साहस की वृत्ति पैदा होगी कुछ करने के लिए कुछ कर करके दिखाने के लिए जीवन को लगाने की इच्छा होगी देश के लिए जीना सीखो इस मंत्र के साथ इस आंदोलन से जुड़कर आपके जीवन में खुशी एवं एक नए उत्साह का संचार होगा साथ ही अपने राष्ट्र को नई ऊंचाइयों तक ले जाने में आप गौरवान्वित महसूस करेंगे once again good evening everyone i welcome you all to dia's uh, gyan sabha and today's topic is global sustainable development role of science technology and innovation and we are absolutely honored to have uh, with us dr rajgopal chidambaram today padma vibhushan padma shri to share his thoughts on this topic and before i uh, invite dr chidambaram for today's talk uh we'll just reflect upon why do we need this topic or why have we today conceived this topic to discuss uh as we saw in that video dr kalam and dr dr pranav pandya ji conceived dia as as a youth movement to propel the youth energy into nation building activities with a modern perspective now pandit shriram sharma acharya ji founder of uh, all world gayatri parivar Uh, which is a youth movement uh, dia of which dia is a youth movement reviewed spirituality more as a subject matter of science rather than a religious philosophy for him the science of spirituality is the ultimate domain of human psychology and all scientific knowledge the material based modern science and the science of consciousness were described by him as the two sides of the same coin he elucidated the deeper aspects of deep ecology cosmic order esoteric events and yet unresolved secrets of nature existence of extra extraterrestrial life even scientific basis of astrology etc and eventually he propounded how every activity and every form of existence from mic micro settler to cosmic levels and the eternal cycle of nature reflect the order of an omnipresent soul controlling power the invisible supreme consciousness which manifests itself in every vibration of energy and pulsation of life so that was his vision of scientific spirituality and he considered science and spirituality as two aspects of the same uh, of 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 the same coin and we are extremely delighted to have with us dr chidambaram today to discuss this important topic and i mean although he needs no introduction but it's my duty to formally introduce him Uh, dr rajgopal chidambaram is padma vibhushan padma shri is known for india's nuclear program smiling buddha which was pokhran 1 operation shakti shakti which was pokhran 2 he has previously served as principal scientific advisor to the government of india as the chairman of atomic energy commission of the government of india chairman of the board of governors the international atomic energy agency that's iaea and director of the bhaba atomic research center 
we are extremely delighted to have you today with us uh, to discuss this important topic on Gyan Sabha, which is a platform, thought platform for thought leaders, where, di where different people from different walks of life have come and have shared their experiences and have shared their vision in respect of how to take this country ahead. I welcome you, sir, and I invite you to share your thoughts with us. To give this webinar talk on behalf of Gyan Sabha. And these webinar talks are an initiative, a good initiative by, by Dia. In fact, it's a fallout of the COVID. The number of webinar lectures have gone up very sharply after this uh, COVID, uh, COVID, COVID pandemic. Are you able to hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yes, sir. But I request all the other parties. What I thought in participants to be the only sentence was all the others can mute their microphones. Okay. Now I remember being at a blood donation campaign organized by the Dia Mumbai in Anushakti Nagar some time back. As you saw just now in this beautiful video, which my my very dear friend Dr. Abdul Kalam was also there, and in fact he and uh, he and, uh, and Dr. Pranav Pandya started this uh, or initiated the process of uh, starting of uh, idea. As you clearly saw, it is a youth-centric organization, and it understand it is also. It's focused on disadvantaged sections of society with emphasis on education, health, self-reliance, culture, and values. Now, these are all education, health, self-reliance, value system. These are all parts of human development. And human development is a part of national development. And national development is a part of global development. And we want this development to be sustainable. The un commonly used United Nations definition of sustainable development is development which meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the needs of future generations. And in their definition, they also, and I quote, provide a framework for the integration of environmental policies and development strategies. So I thought I will speak today on uh, global sustainable development, role of uh, science, technology, and innovation. This is also a cultural organization. Towards the end, I'll show a slide what I think is the culture of science. Can I have the, I'll have the, I'll start my PowerPoint projection, please. The United Nations in 2015 developed these 17 sustainable development goals. And all these goals are, of course, interlinked. No poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being and so on. If a man is not poor, then hopefully he is not hungry. And then he is not hungry, then you can think of uh, good health and well-being and then quality education and so on. There was a meeting of the United Nations STI Forum in May 2017 for which I was invited, but I couldn't go, go there due to various reasons. And they wanted to focus on the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals that I have indicated here. 
and uh, you know i've been saying for two decades and more that everything is contained in what the united nations calls this human development index human development index the united nations defines it in terms of per capita gross national product they used to define it in terms of adult education and life expectancy at birth i've been saying for more than two decades that for a country like india at this stage of development you need only two per capita electricity consumption and female literacy i prefer female literacy to adult literacy because female literacy is not just a measure of literacy but but also a measure of equity and justice in that society you know there are kind of states where the literacy level is high the difference between the difference between female literacy is low female literacy is low and where the average literacy is lower the difference between male literacy and female literacy is higher and i've written on this on the female literacy part that the higher the female literacy the lower the infant mortality the higher the female literacy the lower is the birth rate this is very important and of course the literacy levels in india are going up and our birth rate is coming down as we have more and more working women or educated women and they used to say 2.1 in a family is about the replacement level and we are approaching we are approaching that per capita electric consumption is obviously related to per capita gross national product the more electricity produced the more is the industrial development and more are the goods that you produce and your gross national product goes up but per capita electricity consumption you introduce any electricity producing system electricity by the way is the most convenient form of energy any electricity producing system part will go to industry part will go to big towns a part will also go to small towns and villages which will get better drinking water better primary health care and all these have an impact on health parameters and of course the ultimate health parameter which is life expectancy at birth and this test problem is yes, one minute slide out No, the slide is um, no, the slide. There are some things which can improve decline. I ah, thanks. Next, ah, no, I go. See, the, if you plot uh, the human development index against uh, per capita electricity consumption, and of course, I have made the scale logarithmic scale so that all countries can be accommodated in one slide. otherwise the developing countries will disappear near the origin it is an s shaped curve we are somewhere in the middle and all of us want india to go to the top of the curve and to go there you will have to increase our electricity production maybe six times and while we do this and we provide energy security for the country the growth must also reflect our concern for climate change global warming has started and it can have very dangerous consequences for future generations so we have to and we are concerned very much about uh, for climate change in fact the un sustainable development goal is clean and affordable energy but i must also add here that 
achieving the sustainable development goals is only the beginning for us we want to become a fully developed country and later a knowledge economy what is india for particularly of the youth of a major part of the major part of the is an india which is economically developed scientifically advanced and militarily strong i have often said that national development and national security are two sides of the same coin to be able to develop peacefully you need uh, security of course security by itself is not meaningful it has to be combined with uh, development we want as i said human development index to be high we want an india where there is energy security and also other kinds of security water food and nutrition health all of them depend one way or another on energy security and these securities must be sustainable and all this is possible sustainable only if it, india becomes not just a developed country but also a knowledge driven economy and we need high quality leaders with an appetite for risk taking nothing great is achieved unless you are able to take risk of course after taking proper precautions and after making proper assessments this is a very nice book by actually a couple of books by john brockman this idea is brilliant and the other complimentary book is this idea must be killed number of people have contributed to that and philip rosenweis says when it comes to technological breakthroughs or launching new products it is better to act and fail than fail to act see this is the international panel of climate change fifth assessment report a new one is due any time because they have been giving giving uh, um uh, is annotation request should i approve or should i and i decline see that the international panel on climate change says warming of the climate system is unequivocal there are a few skeptics but by and large the entire scientific community is convinced that uh, global warming is on us and they want to cut it down to 2 degrees for a long time they have been thinking of that during the industrial revolution during this period 1880 to 2012 the warming went up by 1 degree mainly because the greenhouse gases carbon dioxide they go and settle upstairs and then prevent the infrared radiation from leaving the earth so the globe begins to warm and what ipcc says key measures to achieve mitigation goals including include development of renewable energy and india has a very big program international renewable energy centers in gurgaon near delhi nuclear carbon and storage of course hydro is very good too and the climate updates we have had since they are five report have only confirmed the above conclusion see in the short term it may appear that countries in the north, northern hemisphere are not affected as much as those in the southern hemisphere in fact the stanford study shows last year that global warming has increased economic inequality since the 60s countries like norway and sweden they have prospered while the economic growth in warm countries has come down but everybody knows that this may benefit cold countries in the short term but all countries will suffer in the long term one of the consequences the frequency and intensity of extreme events is likely to go up yeah. 
See, obviously, as the IPCC said, nuclear is important. And all of us are in the nuclear community. Of course, we know the importance of nuclear energy. It was a very interesting study by Richard Rhodes, the Pulitzer Prize winner, and it's published by the Yale School of Environment. And he's a neutral person. And he says, why nuclear is so important? It generates base load electricity, no output of carbon, very little. In fact, uh, decarbonizing, if you want, you have to go for nuclear. The amount of uh, fossil fuel which are used for ancillary use, ancillary work, is about 4 to 5 percent, as much as natural gas, natural gas fired plant. Natural gas, carbon dioxide emission is lower than that of coal. And is about as much as solar power. Second, nuclear power operates at much higher capacity factors than renewable energy sources or fossil fuels. Obviously, renewables are intermittent. When the sun is there or the wind is there, you get the energy. If you want to have a continuous power, you have to store it or use it for peak power. Of course, there are some other hybrid possibilities. But the last one, not many people know that the nuclear power releases less radiation into the environment than a coal-fired plant. The coal contains a lot of fly ash. When it is finished, residual fly ash, and that contains plenty of uranium and thorium. And that is more than what the uranium, that is, or the radioactive, the release, radioactivity released in the environment compared to this. See, of course, we are a developed country as far as uh, nuclear is concerned. Of course, India is a very interesting country, economically developing, but parts of the system, SNT system, nuclear, space, some parts of defense, some parts of chemical. We are very highly, highly developed. In the case of nuclear, the former director general of Yuki Amano, he said that I would like to conclude by noting that India's remarkable success in the field of peaceful nuclear technology is an inspiration for many developing countries. Of course, India is also willing to serve as a mentor for other Asian countries that have recently joined the IAEA. You know, he also compliments, he's talking about our three-stage nuclear program, PSWRs, fast reactors, and thorium-uranium-233 cycle. And uh, in fact, uh, I and Dr. Mohammed El Barade were once discussing, former DG of IAEA. I was telling him, if you are able to close the nuclear pipe, fuel cycle with uh, plutonium, the same uranium will give you, say, 50 times more power. If you close the fuel cycle and include thorium in it, the same uranium will give you maybe 600 times more power. So then he asked me, shall we call nuclear as renewable energy? I said, we will be more modest and call it near renewable energy, if you are able to successfully close the nuclear fuel cycle. And of course, uh, our nuclear power plants are doing extremely well, high capacity factors. On December, in December 2018, the unit one of Kaiga broke the world record. 941 days of continuous operation started in May, May 2016. That could have gone on, but they then stopped it for regular maintenance. But nuclear is not just electricity and uh, nuclear weapons. There is practically no aspect of society where nuclear does not come in in one way or another. Food preservation, producing new kinds of hybrids, treatment of cancer, diagnostics, water management. I'll show an example of how the isotope hydrology unit of Bach helped to improve the recharge in Uttarakhand. 
and radiation processing and so on. Of course, India is now looking for international collaboration equal partner basis. As I said, national development is related to global development. You can't cut yourself off. And in science, today's India wants international collaboration on an equal partner basis. For example, in the Large Hadron Collider, we saw the signatures of Higgs boson, the missing particle in the standard model. AFR is a member of the detector group which found this. Now, India contributed $40 million worth of equipment. See, as many of you know, there is an underground tunnel, huh? 26 kilometers in circumference, 100 meters below the ground. When particles, hadrons, protons, that is, they are moving in opposite directions. And once in a while, they are brought together and they collide. When they collide, energy disappears. And you read, you have to read the good old Einstein equation, E is equal to mc squared, wrong, wrong way. Mass disappears, energy is produced. Energy disappears, mass is produced. That's how they do high energy experimental physics. See, this proton is a charged particle bent by dipole magnets. But for focusing, you have to use sextupole, octopole, and decapole magnets mm -hmm. all around the 26 kilometers circumference, maybe 1,800 of these. And all these were provided by India built by an Indian company under the guidance of uh, Bach and our cat. Of course, fusion is the other form of energy. One day it may come and so eat her. See, in the case of the Large Hadron Collider, where we look for the Higgs boson, of course, it, it does other experiments also. We also are an equal partner in the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ETA, which is a multinational project coming up in the Kadarash in France. And the main institution, of course, many institutions are involved in this. The main institution is involved in the Institute of Plasma Research, Kandinaga, which is part of the DAE system. And it's a unique collaborative project with members China, European Union, India, Japan, Korea, Russia, and the United States. And they had this meeting. Dr. Bernard Bigo, who is the Director General, more or than. See, one of the main things we are supplying is this cryostat. This is the largest cryostat ever built in the world in which the tokamak, as it is called, for magnetic confinement fusion will be located 30 meters in diameter and 30 meters in height. Under the supervision of IPR, it was built by LNT in Hazira. And the base has been installed at the ETA in May of, uh, May of this year. Of course, like like uh, nuclear space also that just doesn't launch uh, satellites or put a rover on the moon or plans a mars mission but here also they do so many things they can uh, infrastructure planning forest cover getting decreasing soil and water conservation all these things even i know there is a project uh, where uh, they can tell the fishermen which way the shoal of fish is moving from their satellite photographs so that the farmers are told on their mobile, they have an app there, that if you go in this direction, you will get a better catch up. See, India's needs, India is a very large country which you sometimes forget. Its needs range from nuclear and space to rural. And when I was a PSA, Principal Scientific Advisor to the government, 2004, we had started this RUTAG, Rural Technology Action Group. And 
it's a demand driven innovation strategy demand driven strategy we look where is the demand and then take the necessary development and delivery find the appropriate institution sometimes what happens in science is you have a solution and then we look for the problem but here it's a demand driven innovation strategy rutag is centered in seven iits at present but it has got links to many other academic institutions r and d institutions for example bark and drdu this is one i was showing you here no this is not one i showed you this is a all this daily innovation one can do by a technique called what uh, these guys andrew sanderson and robert sanderson called knowledge brokering what they say is the best innovators use old ideas as the raw materials for a n- one new idea after another and we call that strategy knowledge brokering for example thomas fulton he supposed to have discovered the steam boat steam engine for the boat but actually the steam engine has been used in mines for 75 years before that what thomas fulton did was an application for this now i did some knowledge brokering when i visited the drdo lab in pune they were an r and d lab and they were they make these bridges when our troops are advancing into any minute any minute they make this uh, bridges both for the foot soldiers as well as for the tanks and they are collapsible bridges the foot bridge is a very light alloy aluminum alloy which a jawan can carry on his back at that time in uttarakhand i knew there are a lot of these ravines just then this big uh, flooding had occurred which had affected also badrinath temple but this kind of ravines are there all the time all the time 10 to 15 meters very often the villagers have land on one side agricultural land and their houses are on the other side and all those produce is carried usually by women as you might have seen on their backpack and they have to cross these ravines see some water is there you don't know where you are putting your foot on and the least thing that can happen to you you can sprain your ankle but here once of at the time of that floods the famous floods which had just happened a couple of young women had been washed away in this village called bagi bagi in uttarakhand and so we built uh, i asked the drdo to build this bridge they did it it was uh, it was beautifully done and it uh, anil joshi who is my colleague under this rutak program in uttarakhand lives in dehradun he op- runs an organization called hesco himalayan environmental science and conservation organization and uh, in fact they called me to bagi i did go there to inaugurate this bridge from uttarakashi you have to drive 4 uh, kilometers to reach the to reach the bridge and they had a pandal i said now the journey is over and since it was only an inauguration i was wearing my chappals i asked him where is the bridge he says udhar hai 2 kilometer away you know for the pahadis 2 kilometers is nothing and you have to walk on the edge of the mountain to reach this bridge and i was wearing not i am not even wearing my tennis shoes they said no problem we will hold you one in front one in back maine kya mat pedal chal sakte itni zor se mat pakdo we went there inaugurated the bridge and then my inaugural speech they said i said that main aapko ek nayi kahawat batata hu पहाड़ी न हो तो पहाड़ी का हाथ अपने हाथ में 
See, this is uh, another one which we did, Palki. And I was, uh, we went to Jammu, I met the governor, N.N. Ora at that time. And from there, he arranged a visit to Vaishno Devi. And he told the problem of the porters. The porters have a very difficult problem carrying these passengers. Some of them are not very light either. And uh, he said, can you make this lighter and a better design? Dr. Chakravarti, he runs a very good design center in IIT Bombay. And he said, we'll take it up and redesign the whole thing. And by, I had gone, given, gone for a convocation address in Niti in Mumbai. Director Dr. Karuna Jain also got interested. She is very much interested in occupational health. And so they did a very thorough study. This is unique example of a high-tech engineering design principles brought in to improve a commonly used product and enhanced safety ergonomics was brought in engineering design weight reduction was there and it's also con more convenient for the passengers see what karuna jain and her colleagues found was there are three places where the occupational health is affected one is the shoulder where they keep the these bars and then there is a knee because a lot of strain comes on the knee as they climb the mountain and the back because the back gets very much strained. So now not only have they, they are very happy with these reporters, not only has a new uh, design and the Vaishnav Devi shrine has distributed some hundred of these to the porters, but uh, they have a harness on which they rest the, 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 the bars. The bars are made of stainless steel, not uh, wood. And now it has been a very successful. See, this is another one we started. You know, we missed the microelectronics revolution. So we decided we should not miss the nanoelectronics revolution. So we had an open brainstorming in the PSA's office. And uh, we said, through open brainstorming, we'll select two institutions where we will And Mr. Ravin Shauri was the minister, said, I'll give you 100 crores to be spent here. And two of these uh, centers, Center for Electronics and Nanoelectronics, have been set up in IIC Bangalore and IIT Bombay. They're doing very well. It's a national facility used by academic institutions from all over the world all over India, also some countries, our developing countries in our proximity. Slightly old slide, maybe a couple of years old slide, 500 projects, 700 institutions, and also they have a very strong inter collaboration with MNCs and very good international collaboration because this is one of the best facilities in the world. Indian National Knowledge Network, the second came from a proposal from the PSA's office. This is the biggest in the world, research and education network in the world. It now connects more than 1,600 knowledge institutions in the country. Fortunately, we had experience with this trans Eurasian Information Network. Um, and uh, this was involved. This is uh, uh, with, the, with, with the CERN project. And it is uh, now, now we have gone beyond that. The NKN, which is run by NIC in MIT, the National Informatics Center, it has its own POPs or points of presence in Geneva, Amsterdam, and Singapore. So much data is moving now that this kind of thing is also valuable for big data science. You know, there's a very useful, very interesting book by. You all know Harari, Homodius, A Brief History of Tomorrow. This is a kind of a sequel to his Homo sapiens. And what he says is, humans nowadays completely dominate the planet, not because the individual human is far smarter 
and more nimble fingered than the individual chimp or wolf. Because Homo sapiens is the only species on earth capable of cooperating flexibly in large numbers. Practically, maybe ants are there, but they, do, they are very low level. They, they are not, uh, no other species is there. And communication, the foundation on which the cooperation is based. And now we have e communication, which is uh, represented by this. Well, there are other things India has to work on. You have to be very careful about cyber security. You know, some years back, in 2012 actually, the US Defense Secretary Leon Panetta warned that the United States was facing the probability of a cyber pearl harbor and was increasingly vulnerable to foreign computer hacks who dismantled the nation's power grid transportation system financial networks and therefore the government. So there has been much debate on whether it is a hyperbole or a realistic. Anyway, this is a warning. You know, the problem is the more you connect, the more convenient it is. But then you become more vulnerable. The greatest security is in isolation. So you have to make a balance. Of course, you have firewalls, intrusion detection, and prevention systems, antivirus software, and so on. And uh, then, of course, uh, the problem is that the hackers, the bad guys are also getting equally smarter. And the more you connect internet, you talk about internet of things, you talk about it, internet of things and services in the home. Switch on your microwave oven before you reach your house so that your food is ready in time to eat. But then if a hacker gets in, he'll switch it off and you leave for the office. Artificial intelligence, it is now there in every field from commerce and management to drug design and cyber security. Now we have supervised machine learning algorithms. They have been used for malware classification, spam detection. Of course, you have to guard against what is called algorithm bias. When we think of artificial intelligence, you usually think of intelligence displayed by systems of a type we normally associate with human beings. Can be robots, can be computers, slave manipulators, park users slave manipulators when they're handling, handling radioactive materials. Of course, you can also AI-based expert system for specific talks. Maybe I'll show you a couple of examples immediately after this. It approaches, two approaches are there, as I said, analyzing cognition, but then the other one also is artificial neural networks, mimic the structure and functioning of the brain in deep learning. In fact, uh, neuroscience guys are also learning from artificial neural, uh, neural networks. Of course, conventional machine learning for some reason is called shallow learning, but deep learning because they're able to recognize patterns in various types of computer representation, interpretation of yeah. artificial intelligence. This is from my convocation I gave in uh, Tamil Nadu Medical University in March, just before the lockdown. The diagnosing diseases is the most straightforward application of AI and ML. Because the, particularly in India, where the patient load is very heavy, then of course doctors from their experience see patients' disease pattern. But machine learning involving algorithms, you're given a big, large set of digitized data. And you know, breast cancer, it has been seen, you can decrease the false positive results. I'm sure one day they'll, uh, for COVID, avoid the false positive results. Drug development, we can look at the analytical processes involved and uh, to identify good drug targets. Healthcare, gradually shifted to a digital record keeping. Now this is very, but then of course one has to take care of the privacy of uh, data. Of course we even have a robotic surgery in India now. 
But in all these cases, because of uh, ethics and regulation problems, the final decision is made by the doctor. Robotic surgery also, the control will be with the, with the surgeon. But some people are scared of long-term developments in the AI field. They want international regulation of artificial intelligence. I don't think that's desirable. Stephen Hawking telling a BBC correspondent some time back, development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. I do not agree. Roger Penrose, equally famous mathematician, and many other leading scientists. See, there is a theorem called Goodell's incompleteness theorem. See, what it says really is, oh, possibly 1931, has not been disproved that in any theory, physics or otherwise, you can only set up a set of axioms. All that you can do so far is contrary to these axioms. Mathematically, what is Goodell shows is you cannot prove the theorem, prove the axioms, unless you go outside the system. And we cannot go outside this. That's why Roger Penrose uses that Goodell's theorems to show that humans will always be smarter than computers and computer algorithms and any other cybernetic machines. Because you must also know what is meant by intelligence. Howard Gardner talks of varieties of intelligence. See, if you have a computer, linguistic, visual, spatial, Logical, mathematical, speed, you can't beat that. But musical intelligence? No, oh, can a machine sing like Bhimsen Joshi who passed away just now? Bodily kinesthetic, can somebody bat like Virat Kohli? Of course, later he had a naturalistic, spiritual, existential, interpersonal, can two robots relate to each other? like humans do. Intrapersonal, what is meant by intrapersonal for a robot? See, this is a beautiful review of Ramanujam's. Srinivas Ramanujam, as you know, was a been super genius mathematician, died at 32. Like Vekananda, 30s, Adi Shankara, they all die so early. So, Srinivas Ramanujam has also been called magical genius. What he, one, one, uh, one of his uh, biographers says, there are two kinds of geniuses. One kind of genius whose work when you hear about, you feel that if I had been at the right time, at the right place, I could have done that work. That is says there are very few whom he calls magical geniuses. When you see their work, you ask, how can anybody have done that? Ramanujam was in that category. And what uh, he says, Professor Ezekiel Dror, a man who for most of his life took counsel from a family goddess, modestly declared, goddess Saraswati comes and writes the theorems on my neck, on my tongue. So whose theorems, you know, his famous handwritten, no, like our sutras, he gave the theorem without the proof. And theorems would at intellect, now what his drawer says, is these theorems have been slowly being proved, still some not proved, at intellectually back-breaking cost. Yet leave mathematicians baffled that anyone couldn't divine them in the first place. And then he talks of intelligence in robots. So he says, the current efforts to spawn robots with artificial general intelligence, and beyond them, robots with super intelligence, he says it's just not possible. The phenomenon of Ramanujam is not only beyond the scales of intelligence, but above the concept of intelligence itself. And then this is the one no enhancement of human intelligence opens a door 
to becoming a Ramanujan. And no algorithm is likely to produce robots with the abilities of Raman. See, technology. I have been always saying technology. Okay, a long time back, there was a futurologist, Alvin Toffler. He wrote, yesterday violence was power. Today wealth is power. And tomorrow knowledge will be power. Why did he say this? Violence being power is whoever has the best technology for inflicting violence is powerful. Wealth is power. Whoever has the wealth to convert knowledge in the technology is power. And obviously knowledge is what leads to technology. So I paraphrase Alvin Toffler also a long time back, technology is power. And because technology is power, technology domination is sought through intellectual property rights and technology control regime. We want India to be a global technology leader. India should be in the forefront of creating IPRs and make immune, make itself immune to technology control regimes like the Department of Atomic Energy. And how do you do that? You must develop self-reliance. See, as I said, India wants international collaboration on an equal partner basis. We are building a complex system. Some subsystems are available from a reliable source. Go ahead and put it into your system. But if anything is denied to you, including the proverbial wheel, you must have the capability to do it yourself. So when as Director Bark, I had defined self-reliance as immunity against technology denial in high technology areas. And as I said, we should seek international collaboration only on honorable, equal partner basis. And we must have the courage to be the first introducer of new advanced technology. Of course, we must assure itself technology, viability, importance, safety, do you want it, all that use technology, foresight, and all that. But if you are going to become, wait for somebody else to prove it for you, you will never become a technology leader. In fact, I have often said, the so-called proven technology, of course, unless they are subjected to continuous evolutionary improvements, are often a synonym for obsolete technology. Obsolete technology. It, it, since you are it, a cultural organization also, also. I'm this coming to my last slide, and of course, my 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 feeling is spirituality is there, religion is there, and science is there, and there is a boundary. Of course, you can have scientists can be spiritual, but the first thing is the laws of science are universal. When you talk talk about Maxwell's equations, Schrodinger's equations, Raman effect. We are not worried about where Schrodinger or Maxwell or Raman, which country they belong to, which religion they belong to. This, this and we believe in all those. Of course, after proving it, uh, proving in the sense that nothing is against, no experiment is against all this. This leads to a kind of a universal consciousness. And this happens only in science, not usually found among the practitioners of social sciences like economics and politics. We also expect nature's laws to be stable. We, we expect the inverse law of gravitation, shutting this equation to be valid next year. Of course, our understanding of these laws change with time. We expect that the forces between atoms in an inanimate object the human body and a galaxy a billion life, billion years back are the same. What assures this? This must be an expression of some force, I believe for many scientists. You can call it nature, you can call it God. My last slide is for the youth of the in the group, it's not possible. All we want the young people in this audience, 
on concentrate on how to accelerate this process. For doing this, you must maximize your talents. You need to be optimistic. You must have self-belief. You know Swami Vivekananda said a hundred years back, the old theology was, old, old theology was you believe in God. The new theology, you believe in yourself. In yourself. That is the Character. Character. Einstein. Einstein was once asked, what is it that makes a great scientist? That people think it is intellect, they are wrong, this is the character. So you youth must be optimistic, you must be self-belief, you must have self-belief and you must have character. And you must have passion to achieve great things for yourself and your country. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that uh, scintillating talk. And I mean, you took us from artificial intelligence to technology, to how to reach a uh, common man. In fact, right from the SDGs to per capita electricity consumption, female literacy, and, and indicators such as then economically developed, scientifically advanced, and militarily strong India, along with uh, indicators of human development such as water, food, nutrition, security, etc. So it, it was a comprehensive uh, uh, session for all of us to know about these things, uh, about the IPCC fifth assessment report you talked about. You talked about uh, a brief history of tomorrow by Homo USM. And in particular, the advancements India has made in the domains of uh, uh, international scientific cooperation, space uh, programs, etc. So it, it looks like we are on the road to become um, what Dr. Kalam envisioned as a developed state or, or a developed country. So, I mean, all in all, uh, we sort of connected to what you said and uh, and, and these things are something which we as educated common men should reflect upon and think in our day-to-day -day lives, how much we can contribute in our limited sense, as you rightly said in your last slide. It's it's important for young people, young innovators to take you from, from these success stories. And then so much that's happening in the space of scientific research. I mean, as common people, we don't tend to... Uh, read all, all of this which is happening and, and we are sort of ignorant about this, but this was definitely an eye-opener for us and, and it, it fills us with a sense of pride to know that our country is making so much advancements. On that note, sir, uh, I thank you so much for once again coming on, on the US platform. Uh, and you rightly said that, that you've been to the blood donation camp and it's a bond that uh, that that will grow only, and then we we seek your guidance and and mentorship going ahead as well. Uh, having said that, there are certain questions which our young friends uh, in particular have asked, and uh, uh, which I very humbly would put to you, and um, and if you could guide us on uh, on those questions. Uh, the the first question uh, someone had asked, sir, is in the context. And although you spoke of it in your second last slide when you said that whether you call it nature or you call it God, but the specific question is in, in context of the advancements science has made uh, uh, till now, and we have entered the 21st century, do you believe in a supreme power or do you think there is something which sustains all the living uh, beings and, and, and the non-living matter which is there? You see, it depends on the person's belief, because there are so many wise people who tell you different things. So, you have to decide. Personally, I believe in Advaita Vedanta, which is what I think uh, Advaita Vedanta, this is the monism of Adi Shankara, monism. Of course, you can also believe in duality. So, you have to see, see, this is Something you have to make a make a personal choice, and uh, of course you can do. You can say jnana marga, but then you tell bhakti marga can lead to the jnana marga. Karma yoga. If you read Bhagavad Gita, you are so all these 
all these are, you know, great scientists like uh, uh, Oppenheimer during the Manhattan Project, when you had that blast, atmospheric blast, and it has been given as a book written by Robert Jung called Brighter Than a Thousand Suns. He quotes Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna tells Arjuna about, if I show you my Surupa, it will be like a thousand suns glowing. So you have to make a choice. This is something beyond a point. Nobody can tell. Absolutely. And you spoke about open corners and, and, the, and the concept from the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna said that my Swarup is, is uh, equivalent to a thousand suns. And you spoke about Advait Vedanta as well, sir, which ultimately boils down the question that the question, who am I, is, is, is on an individual. It's an individual journey. As uh, Pandit Sri Ram Sharma Acharyaji also put, that it's a journey of an individual to decide for himself or herself. Uh, of what what uh, is the best route, best spiritual route to uh, to reach the same means, the same goal rather. That was the first uh, question, sir. Moving on, sir, you you mentioned about uh, are you tag and you you also mentioned about knowledge brokering, sir. And you mentioned uh, yes, sir. You mentioned Dr. Anil Joshi ji as well from Hesco. In fact, he came to the Gyan Sabha platform a couple of months ago where he shared his thoughts on. Uh, on how can uh, we sustain along with nature and how can we ensure sustainable development. So, uh, are you tag or no knowledge uh, broking as you mentioned, sir? How can these models be replicated on on a sm uh, on on a wide scale or on a country wide scale so that it can benefit uh, maximum people? See, knowledge brokering is one method. See, firstly, it should be demand driven. That is the most important aspect uh, in rural development, I think. You look at the demand. See, if you stay in Bombay or Delhi and go once in a while visiting there, you don't know what is the demand. That is why in the RUTAG, we work with voluntary organizations led by scientists, like uh, Professor Anil Joshi. That is how we became friends, Anil Joshi, in, in, uh, in Dehradun. Because he was a professor who gave up his profession and started uh, started rural rural development. So once you see my weakness sitting in Delhi or in Bombay is at the grassroots. But correspondingly, my strength is I can find out where the solution is available. And somebody with a scientific background can act as the interface between the two. That is the general method of technology development and delivery. Now you see there are many methods. Knowledge brokering is only one method. The other one I have defined is concept transfer followed by innovation. Concept transfer followed by innovation. Sometimes you may have a very good thing going. That is in Tamil Nadu. But the cost of transfer to let us say Tarkhan may be very, very expensive. So what you there is don't worry about uh, the total innovation. What is the concept? Whether it is a biogas plant or whether whatever the plant or the smokeless shula, find out what find is out it. See the way, See the way, the way, way the Tamilian woman cooks. Tamilian woman cooks it different from how Uttarakhandi woman cooks. The chula there will not fit the chula there. But what is the concept? You do concept, this is what I define the phrase re-innovation. Concept transfer followed by re-innovation, looking at local needs, local raw materials, and using local skills. So there are a variety of methods which have been used by Ruta. Used by Ruta. Yes, seven, seven, yes. yes, please. Seven IITs have done a lot of things. For example, a potter, pottery. Why do you use the hand to rotate the wheel? Sewing machine, we rotate, use the foot. And the foot gets tired less than the hand. And the person, the potter, then has both the hands. So what the IIT Kharagpur had done was to a foot-operated pottery wheel. Next step was a motor-operated. 
and that has made a lot of uh, difference to the earnings, the money they have. So it depends on the local resources, local needs, local skills. Etc. Finally, it has to be demand driven and sustainable. Right, sir. Uh, given the pandemic uh, uh, and the forced lockdown that we are in because of this pandemic, and rightly so, uh, th there is a question uh, that since our country is is a is a country which thrives mostly on the rural population or where the maximum population is in villages, so do you think online education can be a constructive means of ensuring that education is continued in in such uh, troubled times? Firstly, education has to be continued. Absolutely no question of that. Of course, you can shut it down for a while. And if you can't reach physically, you have to reach through electronic. Physically. Electronic. What we should be attempting is to make sure that it reaches the students. Maybe keep a class with one projector with social distancing taken care of. Otherwise, of course, the, the, the urban children have a mobile which they, on which the class, classes uh, come. This is a palliative to and the present uh, situation. But we have, but is a technology which will going to remain. I think webinar talks, seminars, video conferencing will continue. Even after COVID goes away, and one day it will go away. We have passed through so many things. This will go. When I, nobody can tell exactly what is going to go away. That definitely gives us some hope, sir. And uh, which brings me to, to a burning question, which has uh, invariably been a part of a lot of webinars and, and talks, and that is artificial intelligence. Now, uh, we, we talked about artificial intelligence. So do you see it constructively? Uh, supplementing human intelligence or or uh, human resources in a productive way, if it is used in a in a controlled sense or it's used in in a productive manner. And what could be that productive or limited use uh, that that we should be conscious of? See, it depends on field to field. As I said, it is being used from commerce to cyber security. Used very widely in medical field. I see S.K. Sharma that is used by them. It has been used by Nuclear Power Corporation to develop an expert system. It provides decision support and also eliminates kind of a faulty shutdown signals. So it depends on how you use it. Expert system, AI based expert system. Essentially, it is based on big data analytics. Big data analytics followed by machine learning. Machine learning. For example, we developed a, a flood warning system see, after the Chennai 2015 drastic floods. I had requested a, a Subimal Ghosh from IIT Bombay to and a group of people to develop a warning system. See, so much data is there, satellite data is there, IMD data is there, war data is there. Now they have developed their expert system for flood forecasting in, in uh, Tamil Nadu. And of course, Tamil Nadu government was very cooperative, uh, very cooperative. And it is, the warning comes at ward level, can come at the ward level, and it is continuously updated. Of course, the warning may be withdrawn after a while. And then it has recently been completed also for Mumbai. I hope uh, because the Ministry of Environment obviously has to be involved. Then there is a Center for Coastal Research in Chennai, which was very much involved. And ISRO was very much involved. involved. So practically every field you, field you find artificial intelligence. Essentially, you know, if you have data. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Essentially, you are able to analyze data which is available for a, over a period and come to very quick advice, advisory counts, suggestions, which can be made. 
uh, almost brings us to the close uh, uh, of, of this session, sir. And my last question to you would be, also in context of DIA, because DIA was founded on, on a five-fold principle of educated youth, healthy youth, self-reliant youth, cultured youth, and sensitive youth, in turn giving rise to a developed nation, a powerful nation, a prosperous, prosperous nation, a happy nation, and a superior nation. And uh, this was what was at the core of DIA when it was envisioned by Dr. Kalam and, and, and uh, Dr. Pranav Pandya ji. And in fact, I would like to invite you, sir, to Dev Sanskriti University in, in Haridwar once the pandemic is over so that we can be benefited by your thoughts and your vision, sir. Uh, so in, in context of these objectives which uh, with which DIA was formed, and considering that we have so many young friends, uh, students with us today, what would be your advice to young innovators? What should they do? And what are the things that they should keep in mind? See, that was my last slide. Firstly, you must be optimistic. That's the first thing you must be there, optimistic. You must have self-belief. Of course, when I say self-belief, not only in yourself, but in the country, that this country is not stoppable is the slide I have uh, used there. Then we want people with character, actually the value system, and that is what your uh, thing and all our culture, our culture has, has always emphasized on this point. You know, I've said that sooner or later, India will become a developed country. But if at the same time, we are able to preserve our cultural heritage, we will become a great country or really restore to India the greatness it once had. Absolutely, sir. And, and we hope that uh, all of us in our own limited sense contribute to this journey of India becoming a great nation, what great scientists and, and, and uh, our forefathers had envisioned. And we, we are on that journey. We hope it's just a, uh, an impediment in form of COVID which has come. But I'm sure, as you rightly said, we'll overcome this and we'll, we'll cross this obstacle and take the next plunge forward. I once again thank you, sir. And I also thank you a lot of prominent scientists who are with us today. And I can see some of them, such as Dr. Sharma Saab is there. And then a lot of other scientists who are there. I thank you for your valuable time for coming on this platform and, and uh, gracing this occasion. And we had such a scintillating talk and uh, discussion that it has given us many pointers of how to take these innovations forward and at least to be conscious of what's happening uh, in the domains of science and technology, which, which we otherwise don't read or we don't uh, uh, sort of lay emphasis on. So that was certainly an eye opener for us. And uh, we have suggested some readings in our chat box on, on the topic of scientific spirituality because that is what was uh, at the core of uh, uh, DIA when it was founded, that we develop a scientific temper. At the same time, we give a new dimension to spirituality, which is not stricto sensu religious, which, which corresponds with scientific principles. And, and the confluence of science and spirituality is ultimately what drives a human being to develop with ethics and, and with a sense of, uh, as you rightly said, the word character. So Dev Sanskriti Vishwadhyaya is doing the doing exactly the same thing by ensuring man making and character building. So uh, with that note, I would once again, thank you, sir. And everyone who's participated, who's participated today, uh, I thank them all. And I invite everyone to the next Sunday's Gyan Sabha as well. And it's uh, on the same day, same time at 4.30 PM with a different speaker. Please do join us and uh, be a part of this, this confluence of knowledge which has developed so rapidly over the past couple of months. I would also like to thank all the organizations who have supported us uh, uh, in Gyan Sabha, Loctopus, Rotus Part. Uh, then we have the District 3141 Rotaract. We have the NSS unit of, uh, of Nanavati Women's College. And we have uh, Shankar Maharaj College of Agriculture, uh, Amravati. We have Pukar College with us. And we have Advocate Balasai Bapte College of Law, Dadar Mumbai, and Vidyanidhi Junior School College for Commerce and Junior College for Vocational Studies. So thank you everyone for supporting. 
this initiative, the ultimate aim of which is to bring uh, on, on a single platform people from different domains, people from different professions and thoughts, so that all of us are benefited with, uh, with something which is instrumental in shaping not only just ourselves, but also the nation. So on that note, I thank you everyone. And I would invite everyone to join us for, for a Shanti part, which is a collective prayer for the well-being of all, for the well-being of everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay Parohit. It was a thank pleasure you. to be, to interact with you. Thank you. An honor, sir. Absolute honor. Thank you, sir. This is Sanat Kumar here. Ah, hello. I saw you there. I'm very glad that you are here. I saw Vinay Kumar also there some time back. And then Chadda, I see Chadda, Chadda there. Kumar, fun. Yes, sir, absolutely. Thank you to all the prominent scientists and then people from the scientific community who have taken their time out and have joined us today. You know, a warm thank you. Thank you. Quotation now, I see there. Thank <laughs> Thank you everyone for once again joining us. Please do give your feedback in the chat box. Do subscribe Hello. as well. Hello. Keep joining us for further sessions of Gyan Sabha. Hello. Hello. Ma'am, sir.